met her in the fall. Welcome to the Fabulous Picture Show. I'm Amanda Palmer, and this week we have filmmaker Nick Moran and actor Augustus Prue. They're here to talk about their new film based on the inspiring real life story of the kid. Based on a mammoth selling memoir of unmitigated misery, it's about running screaming from awfulness. Kevin, don't go! I am going, and I'm not coming back. And director Nick Moran emphasizes its redemptive journey. Oh, are you all feeling uplifted? Yeah! There you go. Also uplifting this show, we discover how this man uh -huh. turned a wrecked Palestinian cinema into a cultural hub. Philip, Philip, we need a hand here. But first, this year is the 100th anniversary of the Mexican Revolution, and celebrating this occasion is a big bursting piñata of a film that brings together the cream of Mexican cinema. Top Mexican actors Gael Garcia Bernal and Diego Luna pull together a dream team of Mexican talent to produce Revolución. A ten-part film in which ten directors reflect on present-day Mexico. Esta es la belleza mexicana. Esta es la mujer revolucionaria. A hundred years on from the bloody revolution that sought to overthrow the dictator, Porfirio Diaz announced the rich ruling classes. Gael Garcia Bernal's film Lucio follows a young boy confused by contradictory meanings of certain national symbols. Yeah. The myth of religion and the myth of revolution put together, they both kind of uh, uh, impose a way of seeing for the little kid. He's uh, already opening up his eyes for, on both issues. Religion and revolution don't allow personal interpretations, you know. Oh, yes. ¿Por qué no te presionas frente a la tumba de mi abuelita? Porque yo no creo en esas cosas. Despiértelo. Que nos hable tantito. Patricia Riggins' Beautiful and Beloved is about the perennial issue of migration. ¿Dónde llegaron los burritos? I'm a Mexican living in Los Angeles, and when I was asked to make a movie reflecting on what the Mexican Revolution is today, I couldn't help but think of the millions of Mexicans living like criminals, yeah. illegally, you know, being persecuted. Váyase, se puede retirar. Muchas gracias. Nomás mucho cuidado, eh? Sí. México se respeta la ley. Gracias, sí. And what does that have to do with the Mexican Revolution? I think, um, in a way, we need another one. You know, something is missing still. Pues cuántos tiene? Cuatro. Y están todos allá. Ellos. El Efra Menso que no se quiso ir. I have the feeling a country that uh, that pushes you, you know, to 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 have to live, you know, in order to survive, you know. It's a country that needs to change. ¿Usted tiene hijos? Uno. I mean, one of the main engines of the revolution was the inequality between rich and poor, and I think Mexico still struggles with that. Reflecting is a big part of celebrating. You know, you just don't celebrate the birthday, you take stock of where you are. The Palestinian town of Janine on the occupied West Bank was without a proper cinema since the 1980s until recently. And the incredible story behind this, well, it's like something out of a movie. Janine and its 10,000 strong refugee camp. It's historically one of the West Bank's trouble hotspots. It spawned around half of all fighters from the Second Intifada which destroyed much of the city. Together, together. Fakri Hamad is one of those building the new Janine. Up on the wall. This is the cinema hall. This was one of the biggest cinemas in Palestine. We restored the old chairs and we made them wider and more comfy. Excuse me. After lying derelict for 23 years, the cinema reopens tomorrow. Hopefully. France are the France. 
The crucial projection booth window hasn't arrived. As project manager, Philip, ask someone to type it. Fakhri is not short of things to do. Hello. We have now the problem where the people will stay. Uh -huh. But he goes to buy the glass himself. And it's this do-it-yourself attitude that's helped the cinema emerge from these troubled streets. It all started with Heart of Janine, a documentary about 12-year-old Ahmed Khatib, killed by Israeli soldiers in Janine's refugee camp. His parents made headlines when they donated his organs to Jewish children. When filmmaker Marcus Vetter wanted locals to see the film, he realized they didn't have a cinema. So we passed by the cinema and he said it's closed since 87. What a pity. Every NGO we, which we approached, they loved the project, but they said, we are sorry, we don't have budget for it. Okay. But their perseverance resulted in funding from the German and Palestinian government. It's uh, lunchtime and our guest house preparing food for all the volunteers. You can choose. Matched by the ambition of the team. This is our open air cinema. Who see it as a cultural hub. In this area we have our cafeteria and it will help the cinema by providing some income. We are planning to build a wooden shed here that the kids can imagine the life at the beach. With less than 24 hours before the public opening, there's still lots of work to do. At least the projection booth will have its glass. It's very important also to show you the solar power system. I think it's the first cinema in the world which is running by solar power. Crucially, it helps keep the cinema affordable to locals. Cinema Jinin will charge five shekels for a ticket, which means this money is not enough. But by selling solar power and advertising on their roof, Fakhri hopes to keep the cinema running for Janine. The cinema officially reopens tonight, and the anticipation's begun early. But support wasn't always so strong. Janine's a conservative city, and years of isolation behind army roadblocks have bred suspicion. Arif Abu Talib remembers the old cinema and worried about the new one. <laughs> Some people started talking about, ah, they are bringing the Western culture here, they are occupying us in different way. The project did bring many internationals, but they worked alongside locals like 19-year-old Mona Stati. A project like Cinema Janin is one of the projects that opened a lot of doors for, for people as my age. And it's brought jobs to a city with 25% unemployment. Hussein Adabi was a projectionist in the old cinema. As the launch approaches, the people just want to get in. And inside the cinema, things are finally coming together. A spiffed-up factory is quietly confident. We have a great team. I think they will make it really successful. And with the world's media gathered, the launch begins. With the arrival of the Palestinian Prime Minister. Everyone is amazed because it's the first time they see this amount of journalists in the town. And it's the first time the main street of Jenin is closed. It's wonderful. I mean, as a result of work, it's uh, 
event here for our people in Jenin. Indeed, it uh, represents a lot for uh, a lot for all of us Palestinians. I feel inspired, and I do hope that Cinema Jenin will last and we are able to develop. After the presentation in the refurbished cinema, the whole volunteers were working the whole night. So excuse me if there are some errors. The Palestinian summer took them to the outside screen. Where after two years, they showed heart of Janine to the people. I'm so happy. I'm so proud of myself because I reached moments when I decided I can't handle it anymore. I hope the cinema will be the first step in making Janine the Palestinian media town. In part two, we're screening The Kid. I have the filmmaker here, Nick Moran, who's a kid, but actually a filmmaker most of the time. And we have Augustus Prout, who is the kid, or one of the kids in the film. I totally confused him about the film, so we better tell them. This, this was a best-selling book. It was a million seller in the UK, and it's a, it's a biography of uh, Kevin growing up through an extremely violent background. And then it's about his journey into manhood, and then uh, a triumph over adversity. How he, how you know, how he, how he turned all that, that misery and pain into, into success. You had to become a boxer. I did. I got lessons You're from Nick. You're a terrible boxer. I'm an awful boxer. Well, well, he grows up to be a boxer. The bit in the middle is when he can't box. So that's Why is he a terrible me. boxer? I just crap. <laughs> Part two. He met her in the fall. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this special screening of The Kid. Could I please introduce... This is Nick Moran and actor Augustus Prue. Tell us about your film. Um, the challenge is, you, you sit through the movie thinking, how does this get happy? <laughs> because this is, you know, but uh, please bear with me. This is a wonderful journey through somebody's life, and it has a wonderful, uplifting resolve at the end of it. But the adversity is pretty, pretty stark. Well, Augustus, you get to, uh, to live the harrowing part. I, I do, that's right. Uh, basically, uh, sit on <laughs> through, I guess, get the Kleenex ready, and uh, enjoy the movie. British actor Nick Moran. Evening, Fraser. It's a bit dramatic, isn't it? Directs his second feature with The Kid. What's The Kid's name? The Kid, The Kid. Based on the best-selling autobiography of Kevin Lewis. <laughs> the film visits three stages of his life, beginning with the author's brutal childhood. <laughs> Augustus Prue plays teenage Kevin, whose only solace is a teacher who suggests new horizons. Do you like classical music? Uh, I haven't heard any performance. The kid gets caught up in London's criminal underworld. Look, you said no one's going to miss this car for six months, so you've got nothing to worry about. Until he meets <laughs> Jackie. So, what is it that you want to do? Who turns his life around. Oh, well, there's, there's so many things, you know. I, I, I don't know where to start. There's, there's, you know, I want to write. The book, initially written just for Jackie, becomes a bestseller, and Kevin now lives a life far removed from his troubled past. <laughs> so, you're feeling uplifted? <laughs> Let's do that again. It's like if you try it, maybe there'll be more. So, are you all feeling uplifted? Yeah. Yes. There you go. That's how it's done. Do you believe them? <laughs> no! Um, I'd like to think that you do watch the film thinking, how does this become a, you know, a, a, a tale of triumph over adversity? And the surprise is that it works. Yeah! How'd you kiss your mum with a face like that? <laughs> Leave her alone! Or what, Kev? What are you going to the three actors had to find characteristics, had to find idiosyncrasies mm. that belonged to the same person. And certainly as, as you know, he, he, certain things were developed, for example, yep. his voice gets higher as Absolutely. he gets older. I think Augustus had the hardest job because uh, Rupert had done a huge amount of research, basically, as you can see from the end, sort of mimicking Kevin, really. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What happened to you? Nothing. It's, it's, I can't... Go. This is another thing you can't talk to me about. We shot a lot of William stuff first, and, it, uh, you know, and you've got this, the seeds of it. But the most difficult portion is, is connecting the two. And so August, he's the chameleon. He's the guy that manipulated him, himself to, to 
get to give us that bridge that makes perfect sense, you know. Who did this to you, Kevin? She did. You mean your mother? How long has it been going on? Ever since you put me back there. You, Augustus, when you were reading this book, I mean, you had a treasure trove of information to draw your character from, didn't you? I did. Uh, we had two, two autobiographies, and uh, we have Kevin himself, who was a producer on the movie. So first time I had a, a conversation with him was very, you know, it's quite scary. I don't really know how, you know, what, what the etiquette is. How do you talk to someone about this, you know, horrific thing that happened to them and how it affected them? And the way we got over that is by um, talking about Kevin in the third person. Where did the bruises come from? Oh, right, yeah, well, he took a swipe at me and he missed and fell down the stairs, didn't you? Kevin spoke about how his joints hurt, everything about him hurt, everything. It, 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 and to play that, to, to, to understand how that mindset and that, those, that kind of physical feeling affects you day to day, I all sort of went very painfully method on it and sort of I lost about a stone of weight. So talk about some of those things that you had to develop, the walk, for instance. Kevin often spoke about how his clothes were too small for him. That limp, that kind of walk that Rupert and I developed together, this very specific way that he used to, used to walk, was because his shoes are too small, so you, you can't actually physically walk. Nick, let's talk about the music. So the music is a fundamental part of... Uh, yeah, they're one of the, the most interesting things is that you got given us cassette. I brought you this. I said to him, we'll, we'll find it. And he did. So pretty much all of the tunes that, uh, that we re-recorded um, in the film uh, are the actual ones that are on that little tape. Yeah, I can make you a copy if you like. Uh, I haven't got anything to play on. Yeah, it's not just information. Information becomes something you can feel and hold and touch. It's a bit of plastic or it's a prop or it's a... There's a, a boxing trophy that you won, which is the, the only thing he picks up when he picks up the, the, the debris after the house has been repossessed. And that's his, that's his one, you know. So when these stories become things and things become props in the hands of actors, then you have this fantastic sort of bolt of reality. Also, there's an authenticity of the sets, of course. And I read that Kevin particularly, you know, he came on set and, and his wife Jackie was incredibly Every day. supportive. Yeah. yeah. One of the reasons that I thought, yeah, I should do this is because I, brought, I was brought up in a tin house. As, uh, that's, that's, next, that's the road across from my old house and on that estate. All those kids that you see in the film, they're just the local kids because I you know, went to school there. The local hard nuts are sort of where the kids are in my, my class at school. And now they've grown up to be, you know, sort of terrifying, <laughs> straight out of prison. But, they're, but, um, but, <laughs> but, they're, but they're still my friends, you know. Right, let's have a big round with a challenge of the kid, all right? Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, did he act as his advisor, or did he want to be more? He of never, never, never interfered. Mm -hmm. And when we were in the editing suite, you know, it, I, I never saw him at any point. Mm -hmm. And then he watched the film when it was done. So he got all bent out of shape. So, That's not my voice. I don't speak like that. <laughs> I don't sound like that. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Well, what I have to say is the most important thing I've ever said in my life so far. And there's the bit where it segues from Rupert's voice into Kevin's voice. You have to look inside yourself first. And once you've looked inside yourself, look outside. And then he just stopped in his tracks and looked at his wife, at Jackie, and went, I've got to get a voice transplant. <laughs> do they do voice transplants? No, they don't, Kevin. Oh. You all right? I think I'm uh, on my own. <laughs> oh, um, well, come and have a drink with me. OK. I think crucial to this movie is, is the love story. Yeah. I haven't used these yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It's like New Year's Eve. OK. <laughs> you know, there's, there's something incredibly powerful Yeah, if you do it. stuff for the right reasons, it works. If you do stuff for selfish, greedy reasons, reasons it catches up on you. The man writes a book as a love letter to his soon-to-be wife to explain how he is and why he is and all the things he can't say, and that becomes a best-selling book because he does that for the right reasons, for love, you know. I don't care about money and, and jobs and cars and chocolate and stuff. No disrespect to... I just love you. That's all that matters. I've gone through two tissues in the, in the film. I can actually see you're kind of... You're welling up now, aren't you? <laughs> But it's very, very good. Um, how true to the book is it? It's very true up until the last section. You knew I was desperate and you played me like a fool. The David O'Hara character is an amalgamation of two, two people. What do you want? I pepped it up, you know, plot-wise for the uh, for that section, you know, the, the but the bit with the gun that happened, but in a different environment with it was someone else. It wasn't the the guy that was promoting the fights. I've got nothing left to lose. I'll put a bullet in you and then one in me. 
there's often an adoption these days where people say it's pathological now I, we can't change their behavior and there's an element of I'm, I'm going to give up on them and I thought that what this film also captured was that certainly it's difficult but not to give up I think that that difference in attitude between Colin and uh, and the PE teacher, you know, that's that's our good and good angel and dark angel. So you're absolutely right. There are there is an element of uh, well, it's too late for us. Let's just leave him alone. You know? Gordon, what's the story with this Lewis lad? I mean, uh, I'm not one to gossip, Colin. Well, of course not, Gordon. But since you asked, his uh, dad's an alcoholic and uh, his mum's Frankenstein in drag, apparently. Lewis is the bright one of the family. <laughs> This film gets through to us because of reminds us, many of us, of our own setbacks and humiliations to our confidence and success. How can we move forward, break this vicious circle and downward spiral? Kevin breaking that cycle is the real heroic act. He now lives with Jackie and they, they have a, an amazing house and two wonderful kids. And The inspiration behind this is about being the guy that breaks the cycle. Thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Augustus Pru, Nick Moran, please everybody thank them for being here. I keep telling this lot how proud I of you. Every day. Get out of here. You're not too old for detention, you know? Thank you. Okay, it's time to go and get rid of you too. What was he like when you worked together? Is he like your dad? Is he like your brother? He's like an evil stepdad. Yeah, evil stepdad? Evil, evil resentful stepdad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hated my presence. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was just... No, that's that was true. just me. But when you, have, when you have three of you playing the same person, did he show favouritism between you three? Um, I, my favourite <laughs> was <laughs> William. He's William a great was very kid. Cute. He's he really points. cool. He's a really eyes. cool kid. He's your favourite? Yeah, and then he grew up. Yeah. <laughs> and as he grew up, he got worse. <laughs> to me, this irritating yeah, whiny little... I am going, and I'm not coming back. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate this film? I would give the kid eight out of 10. The violence was extreme, um, and especially that juxtaposed with the, the ending, the uplifting ending. Motivational, inspiring, and positive. It's like a living nightmare, um, which ultimately turns into a dream, I suppose. Mm -hmm.